In 1968, it fractured, when Jews and blacks found themselves caught in a tragic struggle, with New York City school teachers facing off against an African-American community over control of the neighborhood schools. It is a well-known fact that the overwhelming majority of the teachers in New York City are of the Jewish faith, and I think the anti-Semitic factor is quite substantial at this point. I think it's moved from a covert element to a very overt element in this uh, whole dispute. I didn't believe that this was happening. I really didn't believe it, but it finally sunk in that this is really happening. And I never thought that I would get caught in something where I would be labeled as an anti-Semite, but I was. The awful thing that happened in Ocean Hill Brownsville was that there were two forces that did not want to be at odds with one another, but had to be at odds. And there was really no obvious reconciliation possible. In essence, this has the makings of a tragedy. The opening act of the tragedy began on May 9, 1968 when 19 teachers and supervisors in the Ocean Hill Brownsville section of Brooklyn were notified that they had been transferred. I was in my classroom and a monitor came in, asked me to go down to the office where I was handed a letter. Dear sir, the governing board of the Ocean Hill Brownsville Demonstration School District has voted to end your employment in the schools of this district. This termination of employment is to take effect immediately and it was signed by the Reverend Herbert Oliver, chairman of the Ocean Hill Brownsville Governing Board. The grades were low. The discipline was uh, a great problem. Uh, children were not really getting what we felt they should be getting to prepare for the future. I would say 95% of the teachers in the district were white, and we felt that there needed to be more black teachers and principals in the schools so that the children would have a chance to aspire and see that maybe they can achieve as well. No one was happy with the all-black schools in Ocean Hill, Brownsville. Test scores were among the city's lowest. Classes were overcrowded. Dropout rates high. With the system failing, Local school boards were established to allow African-American communities to manage the schools themselves. African-American leaders embraced the experiment. But the teachers felt their livelihoods threatened and feared that the plan would be an educational disaster, further segregating New York schools. The community and the teachers were on a collision course. Most of the teachers came from more or less the same areas and background that I did. In my case, I was the first one in my family to attend college. Most of us wanted to achieve, we wanted to move up. Teacher salaries were terrible, so I had an after-school job, I had weekend jobs, I did tutoring. Eight years before, underpaid teachers had organized a union which helped improve their salaries and working conditions. Most of the union leaders were Jewish. When the union learned that the school board had transferred its teachers and supervisors, it reacted swiftly. The union sent them back to the classrooms. They were met by a wall of resistance. Black teachers, students, and neighborhood residents stood in their path. We tried to enter the school and were blocked at the door. They called pigs, uh, or to that effect, and uh, make sometimes some statements that approach the rest. Any, anything physical? Not yet, uh, today, anyhow. We were obviously uh, frightened, but uh, at this point, there were already a lot of police in the area. Nauman and his colleagues were turned back and the 350 union teachers in Ocean Hill, Brownsville, walked out of their classrooms in a show of support. In the next six months, the union would strike the entire school system three times, bringing education in New York City to a standstill. I did not feel strong anti-Semitic feelings before this all happened. 
There were clearly black-white issues. But as this developed, it became more and more anti-Semitic. There was name-calling. Some were racial in nature. And I must say that some of the people, uh, even on our side, we were not happy with. Reverend Oliver, what about the uh, business of anti-Semitism? We were told, what kind of um, scars do you think this is going to leave between teachers and other teachers, teachers and children, and in the city itself? Yes, there will be scars left, it seems, because there have been so many uh, untruths floating around. But uh, people must, uh, the teachers must realize that uh, the communities must be heard. And uh, it's unfortunate that, it, that scars must come, but we have had 300 years of scars, and it's about time those scars were healing. The governing board was dealing with systemic racism, and Jews were part of that systemic racism. To get a principal in that particular district, there were 800 whites ahead of the next Negro. That meant maybe 20 or 30 years before you could ever get a black principal there. In the South, many Jews came and helped to help break down, and that was good. But many Jews are part and parcel of American system of exploitation of blacks. After generations of being an oppressed minority, Jewish Americans now found themselves regarded as part of the tyrannical majority. Toward the end of 1968, after walking the picket lines on and off for months, the teachers reached a settlement with the city and went back to work. We lost. And the whole governing board got labeled as an anti-Semitic group. And that was a very heavy label to bear. It was a jarring experience. The alliance that existed between Jews and blacks uh, was severely damaged by this thing I was involved in. Uh, I, I feel badly about that to this day. The feeling of camaraderie that blacks and Jews had that seemed to be just natural, it's gone. The strike ended, but the repercussions continued to reverberate. Less than a month after the teachers went back to work, the tensions erupted again. In 1968, Julius Lester was hosting a radio program featuring jazz and conversation and interviewed African-American school teacher Les Campbell. Before we went on the air, Les showed me some poems that a girl in his class had written him. And one of the poems was, um, you know, hey there, Jew boy, you with that yarmulke on your head. Hey there, Jew boy, I wish you were dead. And so that um, I wanted listeners to know what response was coming from students in terms of the kind of vitriol that was being spoken about uh, community control and this, that, and the other. So I asked Les to read the poem on the air, and Les looked at me and he said, man, are you crazy? The poem was called Anti-Semitism. Hey, Jew boy with that yarmulke on your head, you pale-faced Jew boy, I wish you were dead. I can see you, Jew boy, no, you can't hide. I got a scoop on you, yeah, you gonna die. I'm sick of hearing about your suffering in Germany. Next thing I knew, I was known as the number one anti-Semite in the country. My suffering lasted for over 400 years, Jew boy. I was angry at Jews because Jews put themselves forward as being most able to understand blacks. And so that was not forthcoming from the water Jews at the time. And so, yes, I was angry. And, and airing the poem was one way to express the anger that was also there in the black community. Many African Americans agreed with Lester, insisting they had no special hatred of Jews, that the issue wasn't anti-Semitism, it was racism. As the African American writer James Baldwin put it, it is cowardly and a betrayal of whatever it means to be a Jew to act as a white man. Jews were white people that were more vulnerable to attack. It's a paradox, because on the one hand, blacks felt like we can hate you because everybody hates you. On the other hand, we can be more hurt by you because we had more hope.